morning, and welcome to Trinity Reformed Church. Praise the Lord with your whole heart, in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in him. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He's made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's worship and rejoice in his creation. And now please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. I have decided to uh, stop reading at verse 68 of Matthew 26. So we'll be reading Matthew 26 verses 57 through 68 and come to see the first trial of Christ our Lord before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. Here's the reading of God's word. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. And at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you were the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said to him, He is deserving of death. And they spat in his face and beat him and struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us. Who's the one who struck you? Here is the reading of God's word. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you to learn from your word. Father, I ask that you would open our ears. That you would truly hear. And Lord, also that you would keep my lips from error. For Lord, I am here to serve you. We are here follow you. Gracious Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we look at the first of two trials that Jesus faced. This one is before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of all the Jews. It's important to understand that it was a mockery of justice. And yet the greatest trial of all time. I'm sure many of you remember trials in which the nation was glued to the news accounts, either on television or radio and newspapers. The trial of O.J. Simpson was one of such, or the impeachment of Bill Clinton. There was greater trials than that. There were the hearings revolving around Richard Nixon and the Watergate scandal where the it was the most watched television shows of the time. And even the rebroadcast from gavel to gavel made by PBS later in the day was the most watched show ever at the time. It was the show that assured the continuation of PBS as an entity. But even that affair was a minor splash 
in comparison to the Nuremberg trials in the aftermath of World War II, and it's hard to forget the trials of Martin Luther or Michael Servetus during the Reformation or all of the martyrs in Fox's Book of Martyrs. The list can go on and on of the trials that affected nations and the world, and yet this trial of Jesus has had a greater impact on mankind than any other trial in the history of man because it was God's interaction with man. It was God being put on trial by man. And yet at the same time, it was a complete mockery of justice. And it was so on multiple levels. It broke the Jewish law at every turn. What is seen here in the words and deeds of the Sanhedrin is a glimpse into the depths of the fallen human condition, of the basest nature of men. And yet, it's also a look into the dignity and the humility, and the mercy of the Lord God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ. Just as we have a legal system here in the United States, so do the Jews. The trial would be like a trial before the Supreme Court of the United States. That, in essence, was what the Sanhedrin was. They ruled not only the Jewish justice system, the Jewish religion, the Jewish world, even. It should have been a sober occasion that followed rules of decorum and proper judicial procedure, just as we do in our courts today. In this case, in the case of the arrest and trial of Jesus, there were many unlawful aspects of their behavior that broke the Jewish rules of justice. First and foremost, one was not supposed to be arrested based on the betrayal of another in Jewish law. The betrayal of Judas should not have been grounds to arrest Jesus. Trials were not supposed to be held at night, but the Sanhedrin was in such earnest to make sure he died that they broke that rule as well and rushed him to trial right away. There was also supposed to be an indictment and charges filed, just as we do in our criminal courts here in the United States, and yet... They had no charges. There was no indictment. Yet we see also the priests are completely unprepared for the trial, and there were, there were no charges made against Jesus. They were trying to figure the charges out during the trial. They were trying to actually find wits, witnesses during the midst of the trial. They must have sent runners out at the middle of the night. Hey, did you see anything that Jesus did that was blasphemous? If you have, come on down. Trials were supposed to take place over a minimum of two days, and yet this rushed affair takes place over one night. And finally, the high priest wasn't even supposed to get involved directly in the case, but of course we see Caiaphas does exactly that. And then we see the Sanhedrin also trying to stick to the laws in other ways with the finding of the witnesses. They were trying to give a sham trial with the appearance of correctness, with correct charges that they could formulate based on the false testimony of these witnesses. They finally, they find two witnesses that seem to agree with each other, saying that Jesus had said that he's able to destroy the temple and rebuild it within three days. Now, that they would have been interviewed separately, just as we do in our courts today. And aside from the fact that this was not what Jesus said, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. We know from Mark's gospel account that even the testimony of these two men didn't agree with each other. They couldn't be used as witnesses either. The elders and priests were trying to make fallacious charges stick, and they couldn't. And during all of this, Jesus remains silent. Just as we see in Isaiah 53, 7. 
where it prophesies just about this saying, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and his sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Which in reality was the only good course of action in the face of this travesty of justice. And when confronted about this by the high priest saying, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? He continued to remain silent. And the language there shows a long, purposeful silence, a, a pregnant pause, if you will. Jesus was not going to play their game. It shows a calm and unperturbed nature. Jesus is implacable in the face of their accusations. Stalwart in his silence in the face of this mockery of justice. And that's when things change dramatically. Caiaphas takes an active role in the proceedings, which he shouldn't have done. But he is being the showman at this point, and he said, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you were the Christ, the Son of God. Now, this was the form used for putting people under oath in the Jewish courts. The term under having the meaning that one, the one being made to take the oath was laying their hands upon the thing that they are to swear by, much as we might take an oath with our hand on a Bible. Jesus is to swear by the living God, the one and only God. Now, at this point, Jesus has to say yes or no. He really doesn't have an option here. He has to answer. <clears throat> and before looking at his answer, I want to look at the question posed to him first. Tell us if you were the Christ, the Son of God. Now, this is actually a perfectly formulated question. The, the priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees were very good at this. We saw this especially in the temple courts after uh, the triumphal entry as they're, they're questioning him, trying to catch him up in some way. And you see, if the high priest had only asked if Jesus was the Christ, that's the Messiah, the anointed one of God, Jesus could have replied in the affirmative with no guilt. All he would have had to do was wait him out, wait to see if it was true or not, if what he said came to pass as with any other prophet. There were others that were also called Messiah in the Old Testament. The prophets were anointed by God, Messiahs of God. Um, in 2 Samuel 1.14, it's written, So David said to him, How was it? You were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed. It's the Lord's Messiah. When David was speaking to the man that had killed Saul. Even though Saul was, by that time, an apostate. He turned away from God. Solomon calls himself the Lord's Messiah in 2 Chronicles 6.40. And as to the Son of God, Jesus had actually dealt with this accusation prior by quoting Psalm 82, verse 6, where it says, I said you are gods, all of you are children of the Most High. Jesus could have answered to this as well without any danger because many Jews were called sons of God. The stroke of genius was to combine the two. By combining the two, there was no way to answer it affirmatively affirmatively and, and not be called blasphemous. By doing so, Caiaphas was asking Jesus to tell the Sanhedrin if he was or was not God, if he was or was not divine. An affirmative answer would be saying, yes, I am the Messiah who is God. That's what Caiaphas was asking. And to the Sanhedrin, that would be, as I said, blasphemy, because that would be claiming to be divine. And that's exactly what he does. And he goes even further. He answers, it's as you said, 
Nevertheless, I say to you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, if we look at Jesus' answer phrase by phrase, it is clear and powerful. It's a statement of his divinity. First, of course, he says, it is as you say. In other words, Caiaphas, you're correct. I am the Messiah that is the Son of God. I am divine. The next thing he says is, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And this is invoking Daniel, Daniel 7, 13 and uh, 14, where it says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. But it's also important to look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 where it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who, who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Jesus is telling them in no uncertain terms that they will see him glorified. And that is talking about his resurrection. He's also telling them in no uncertain terms that he is the right hand of God. He's telling them that, that he is given dominion over God's creation, and that means over the Sanhedrin as well. This is also a good time to look at the title that Jesus preferred the most for himself. As he says in his answer, he uses the term Son of Man. And there's something very important about that title, because it's not the same as the Son of God. It's not as the Son of God that Jesus is glorified. In that aspect of his personality, he has divinity. He is glorified. He laid aside his glory for a while so that he could become incarnate and live on the earth a life of humble humility. But the Son of Man, that's the aspect of his human nature. It's his human nature that must be glorified and honored and seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And of course, the two natures are combined. They're separate, but they're combined in one person. That's who Jesus is, fully human and fully God. But it is the point of the resurrection and the ascension. It is to glorify the human nature of Christ to say this is my son in whom I am well pleased to show the promise of the resurrection is true for those who believe in him for he is the first of many who will rise from death the Sanhedrin only wanted to humiliate him and yet through their actions he ends up seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty with all power and all authority over heaven and earth this is what Jesus swears to. He can do nothing but tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And that's exactly what he did. He claimed divinity. He claimed to be fully human. Fully God. And yet Caiaphas tears his clothes and cries out, that's blasphemy. And furthermore, makes the case for Jesus' complete guilt and ultimate death sentence. He declares that the need of witnesses was over. Don't have to have any witnesses. And he asks the rest of the Sanhedrin what they think after hearing his blasphemy. And they all say that Jesus is deserving of death. It's of some interest that those gathered were most likely his cousins and relatives, and they had their own little clique going that they gathered in the middle of the night, enough to get a quorum. 
and pass the sentence of death. There are those that say that Caiaphas was surprised by Jesus' statement and that his outburst is an honest one, but this is likely the furthest thing from the truth. You see, Caiaphas was the son-in-law of the true hereditary high priest, Annas, and was appointed by the Roman government as high priest. He was a shrewd politician. He was in the pockets of the Roman government, and he knew exactly what he was doing as he led the Sanhedrin into following his will with his dramatic flair. And before we move on, this is what should have happened in a Jewish trial. At this point, it was the duty of the Sanhedrin to prove or disprove the claims of Jesus, not just react with the charge. It was the duty of the elders to actually make a defense for anyone that was in danger of being put to death. They could have asked if Jesus' claims matched with those found in the Old Testament or not. It wouldn't have been that hard. Where were you born? Oh, Bethlehem. Check. Was your mother a virgin? Oh, yes, she was. Check. Do you happen to be related to King David? Why, well, yes, my mother and adopted father are both related to King David. You know, that fellow John the Baptist sure seems a lot like Elijah. There's another check. You know, Jesus did seem to do a lot of miracles, didn't he? He healed a lot of people. Well, that kind of checks off a box for the Messiah. Isaiah 61 speaks of that. And, you know, oh wow, wasn't the Messiah supposed to be betrayed by a friend of his, as it says in Psalm 41, verse 9, that he was by Judas Iscariot. You know, the Messiah was supposed to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, so it says in Zechariah 9, 9, and Jesus had done that less than a week prior. You know, yes, he's supposed to be despised and rejected by his people as well as being familiar with suffering, as it shows in Isaiah 53. And the Sanhedrin is certainly about to make him suffer, aren't they? Maybe they should have said he was the Messiah after all. As to the Son of God, Psalm 2 and Isaiah 9 speak of the Son of God. Isaiah 7 and 9 speak of the humanity of the Son of God, of God coming in the flesh. And there are many passages in the Old Testament where God comes to man as an angel of the Lord. For instance, in the furnace, the fiery furnace in Daniel 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the fourth was like a son of God. I'm sure the Jews wouldn't have believed the evidence. The Sanhedrin, their mind was shut off but they could have at least tried to follow through with their responsibilities. But these men were more concerned with finishing their plot to have Jesus killed in a legal murder, in a sham. So they declare him guilty, and then we see the basest side of human nature. They spit in his face. They mock him. They beat him with their fists and slap him, and they may have hit him with sticks or clubs as well. The word that is translated as the palms of their hands can mean a slap or a fist or using any other implement to strike the person. We learn from Luke that they covered his head and hit him in the face and said, prophesy who is the one who struck you. They're, these are the so-called greatest men in Israel. Priests, Pharisees. And they're acting no different than a school-age gang of bullies. They're displaying their true sinful nature for all the world to see. They were not only providing a picture of total cruelty as they strike a bound and blindfolded man. 
it's clear that they are completely closed-minded and arrogant men reveling in their cruelty. They were enjoying their sport. They were baiting Christ. The lesson for you is that these great men are no different than men and women are today. The gospel is proclaimed throughout the world. You can see it on billboards as you drive down the road. You can see it on television. You can hear it on the radio. You can see it proclaimed at concerts and on street corners. You can hear it in thousands of churches on Sunday mornings. You can watch it on the internet. You can read it in a Bible. And yet millions upon millions turn their back to it every day with closed minds, unwilling to even examine the truths of God. They won't listen. They won't give it a second thought unless it is to condemn the foolishness of the word of God or the gospel, <laughs> taking a statement out of context. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. I don't think that sounds very much like a loving God. It's not the point of the story at all. They're neither open to the truth, nor do they seek it. For there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands, there's none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside, they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb, with their tongues they have practice deceit, the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes, so writes Paul in Romans 3. Most of the world is no different than Caiaphas. They claim that Jesus never said he was God, but he did on more than one occasion. And when they couldn't get it, he spelled it out under oath in a court of law that he was and is the Son of Man glorified and will be sitting on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And yet he was denied again and again by his own people. He came to them. He was in the world and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. From John 1, 10 and 11. But that's not the important thing right now. Those men and women that have gone before have already been judged and found to be either righteous through faith in Jesus Christ or unrighteous. They either enter into eternal life or an unrighteousness, or condemned to eternal death. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Are your, ear, are your ears open to the word of God? Can you feel God drawing you in if you feel that call upon your heart? Stop kicking at the goad. Stop fighting against him. For with Christ Jesus, there is grace and mercy. Have you taken the time to actually think about what Christ said? Have you actually looked at his claims? Have you thought about his defense? Or have you, like the Sanhedrin, dismissed him without a fair hearing? I challenge you to give him that hearing. Look into the evidence and find out who he truly is. Because Jesus isn't the one on trial anymore. He was vindicated and glorified by his heavenly Father, and he sits at the right hand of the Lord God Almighty. His trial is over, and the Lord God has declared him truly righteous, so much so that he can impute his righteousness to you and make you righteous before your heavenly Father. But to do that, you have to accept Christ Jesus into your life, into your heart, you need to dedicate yourself to him because the fact of the matter is that you are the one on trial. Your life is the evidence against you. Have you lived up to his standard of perfection? Are you living your life for God? 
or are you living your life for yourself? Those are the choices. If you're not living for God, then your condemnation is assured. Come to Christ Jesus and believe. You will be set free from your sin and from death and you will truly live. Come. Be born again by the Spirit of God. Christ Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. He is faithful to forgive. He is faithful to give you life. Because he died for you. He died for sinners. Come. Repent. Believe. And be saved. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we are yours. We praise you for the wonders of your gospel that you would even deign to give us salvation, redemption through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray as we go out this morning that you would be upon our hearts, that your will would be in our minds, on our lips. Your truth, the truth of your salvation that you offer to those who believe that we would plant that seed that your Holy Spirit would go to work and draw them into your church in faith. Gracious Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Go out to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>